Hello there. Good morning. Dear Gachtina and greetings from Brussels, from Belgium. My name is Maeve McMahon and I'm an Irish journalist here in Brussels for Euronews. So I'm delighted to be with you this morning on not just a professional capacity, but also a personal because I'm also a very proud Erasmus Plus alumni. A couple of years back, I'm not going to say when, I went on an Erasmus year to Hamburg in North Germany and I have never looked back since. It was incredible, a life-changing experience. So I'm so pleased to be with you today for this Lergus Forum. So good morning to you all. And this forum, of course, as you know, brings together all involved in European programmes that are managed by Lergus to learn, of course, from each other and to recognise as well and just take stock of the amazing work being done in organisations all across Ireland. Now, last year, you might remember, it was the first time ever we hosted the Lergus Forum in this kind of virtual space. But at this stage, you're all pretty familiar with this type of way of um, meeting people online and virtual networking. So I hope you feel comfortable and that you're ready to engage what I hope will be both an impactful and inspiring morning. Now, back on June the 22nd, we also hosted the national launch for the new round of European programmes. That was the start of the next chapter in the European work and the European programmes. And that's why the Lergus Forum event today is called New Horizons. And the Lergus team are very much behind the scenes today and they're here to help you take part in any of those programmes. And we'll be hearing as well from the programme coordinators to see how you can get the most out of these programmes and learn how they work and how actually you can practically get involved in them and get the most out of them. But before we get started, just a couple of announcements so that you make sure this event is smooth and you don't have any technical glitches. If you do, just drop a message in the chat to the Lergas comms team and they will respond as soon as possible. Anya, Charis and Fanula are there to help you out. And also, if you're on social media this morning and you want to tweet about the event, tell us where you're joining from and tell us um, what you think about the event or if you have any questions throughout it. You can use that hashtag Lergas Forum. But for now, to kick things off, I'm going to hand you over to someone who knows a lot more about European programmes than me. So let's bring in Lergas Executive Director, Lorraine Gilligan. You're welcome, Lorraine. The floor is yours. Thanks so much, Maeve, and thank you for welcoming us this morning. Good morning to everybody. Uh, another year has passed, and once again, it's my pleasure to welcome you to this year's Lergas Forum. And to have people joining us online once more from all corners of Ireland and Europe. 2021 was a very significant year for all of us in Lurgis, and I'm sure it has been for you also. With easing of travel restrictions, we're seeing a gradual return to international mobility, and many postponed projects are picking up where they left off once more. We believe in the transformative power of traveling to and experiencing other cultures. So it's been very heartening to see this renewal of activity, but it's been even more heartening to know that international exchange has never stopped, even during times of lockdown. Throughout this year, we've been working on different ways to connect people from other communities and other cultures, whether that's through our online training events or through digital initiatives like our adult education platform, ePale, and our school linking program, eTwinning. Just last week, we hosted the first Lurgus Innovative Learning Awards, the Lilas celebrating the most creative and inspiring communities, organizations and teachers at the forefront of education and learning across Ireland. One e-twinning project from those awards that really stuck out for me was called Learning to Love Our Wonderful World, where a fifth class group in Kilkenny joined up online with a school in Austria and they planted native flowers to support biodiversity in their schools. And it's just a great reminder that the people we work with haven't lost any enthusiasm for connecting and finding partnership with others in the past two years. European programs are also about working together and creating a more positive and inclusive society for us all. So those awards and the projects you'll hear from later today, they also symbolize for me what we in Lergus are here to do. This year, we launched our new strategy with a renewed focus to support an inclusive Ireland where we can all participate in and enjoy the transformational value of international learning experiences and be supported to reach our potential. We've identified our priorities to achieve this. 
So we believe that people matter, that programs work and that our programs transform. I've worked closely with the Lurgis board and with our colleagues in Lurgis to make sure that those priorities are at the centre of our work with you. We strive to make the opportunities available through the European programmes as accessible to as many people as possible by offering strong support to anyone who'd like to apply for funding, as well as to our current beneficiaries. We have a huge programme of training and information events, and I'd invite you to look through our website for those, which we also relaunched this year to be a more attractive and accessible information source for you. At this point, there's no doubt that Irish people, and especially Irish young people, still want to make connections and gain experiences outside of their immediate comfort zone. And this was very recently demonstrated by the huge response to the Discover EU initiative, where young people who turned 18 in 2020 or 2021 could apply for travel passes to discover the continent of Europe and the culture of Europe for themselves. This year's round had nearly as many applicants as in all four previous rounds combined, and the demand from Ireland significantly exceeded the quota that we had. Young Irish people also continue to be deeply involved in the European Solidarity Corps, volunteering both at home and abroad to make positive contributions to society. Recently, some young people returned from Greece and they told our Lurgis colleagues that international volunteering was good for the soul and how much they appreciated that European funding and support made it possible for people with fewer opportunities to have these experiences. Very often I speak about the transformative power of taking part in our programmes and it's really great to know that the impact is long lasting. A recent Lurgis research into the education and career paths of vocational learners after they return from European work placements shows us that more than three quarters of them said their placement had developed or improved their communication and team working skills and their ability to work in an international environment. Uh, they told us that they use these skills to progress into employment, with almost two thirds of them agreeing that their participation had helped them to get a job. The further education sector in Ireland is extremely diverse, involving people of all ages and backgrounds, and it's important to recognise how EU funding and support, combined with the support received from the sending organisations, opens up opportunities to those who may not otherwise have them. I hope today that you'll be inspired by the wonderful people who are involved in our programmes. You'll hear from some of them later today in videos and in the panel discussion with Maeve. And we want to be able to explore and to discover the new horizons that are out there by engaging in international work and also engaging with Lurgis. We will do everything that we can to help you explore those new horizons. As Maeve said, our staff are online and they're here to support you today and every other day. One of the ways that we want to help today is with the two breakout sessions after the main forum. The first one is about well-being and it looks at how to look after your mental health in challenging times. And I think we can all agree that 2021 has been another challenging year. And we just think it's very important to create and make space to have this discussion and to support each other. The other session looks at the findings, as mentioned earlier, from Lurgis Research on the long term impact of European work placements on the careers and education of vet learners. So if you've ever wondered what difference a European work placement or experience can have on a young person or participant several years down the line, this is the place for you. You'll have that today. Before I hand you back to Maeve, I would like to also thank all of my colleagues in Lurgis and all of the people and partnerships that we work with for their continued commitment to and engagement in our programmes. So I really hope you enjoy our forum and the plans that we have for you this morning. Thanks for joining us. And thank you so much, uh, Lorraine Gilligan there, Lurgis' Executive Director. And so interesting to hear there was such a positive response in Ireland to the Discover EU and for all those other details. So thank you so much for them, Lorraine, and for setting the stage for today's Lurgis Forum. So now without further ado, we can move on and bring in a video message that NASA Harrigan had received for us this morning. Good morning, everyone. It's a pleasure to join you at this morning's Lurgis Forum to recognise and celebrate all you have achieved in European education, in training, in volunteering and youth projects during an often challenging year for all of us. 
I'm particularly pleased to join you at the start of this new European program cycle, running from 2021 to 2027, because for the first time, the EU has identified a core cross-cutting priority of environment and fight against climate change for both the Erasmus Plus and European Solidarity Corps programmes. This has been long, you know, an important issue for the Greens, obviously, um, but it's incredibly significant to see a commitment to this urgent fight embedded in European programmes like your own. It's also a key feature of next year's European Year of Youth, which recognises that Europe needs the vision, it needs the engagement and the participation of all young people to build a better future that is greener and more inclusive and digital. Of course, many participants in the programmes that Lergus runs are young people, from school pupils involved in e-twinning uh, virtual exchanges to volunteers in the European Solidarity Corps working to better their communities, both at home and abroad. This perhaps contributes to why environmental concerns are increasingly coming to the fore in European funded projects. As organisations like your own respond to these needs and as young people start to lead projects themselves, that is incredibly inspiring for somebody like me to see and it gives us great heart. This can be a very powerful impact on wider Irish society. There is a striking example on the Lairgus blog, um, which I read of a, of a group of young people in Waterford and South Tipperary who started a project on their own initiative called Youth Climate Changers. Their work inspired other young people to take up climate action projects in Waterford and South Tipperary Youth Service and perhaps influence projects now underway, such as the Native Irish Tree Trail and an environmental app called Community. That's a small example of how involvement in European projects can contribute to our wider national and global development goals. And certainly if we're going to achieve the kind of change we need, we will need to see solidarity and all hands on deck. Of course, as we've seen at the COP26 conference this week, there is a world of difference between aspiration and action. Making environment and the fight against climate change not just a priority, but a practice will take active involvement from all of us here today. European programmes are taking steps towards this, including offering additional funding for using sustainable travel methods, which is a very simple beginning step to getting things right. But perhaps more importantly, European programmes are an opportunity to work towards one of the sustainable development goals to ensure all learners acquire the knowledge and skills needed to promote sustainable development. Understanding what we're fighting for is a really important step. And of course, there is a huge strength in understanding that your experiences and the things that you care about in your home and in your community are shared by others right across Europe. Building a sense of community and solidarity with others, not only in our own immediate neighbourhoods, is vital. It's so important. There is no doubt that 2021 um, has been another challenging year for many of us. And I commend, you know, the staff, the organisations here that have made such a brilliant effort connecting with others and has made, you know, that connection a prime part of the work that you do. I wish you the best of luck in all your projects and I hope you enjoy this forum and that it's very useful to you. Goodbye. TD Deputy Nasa Harrigan there bringing us this message this morning. Thank you so much to her for that. And as she outlined and also Lorraine Gilligan told us, European programmes, well, they're just a brilliant way to just reach out, connect, learn and share practices with people all around the continent of Europe. And to see exactly what this all means for Irish projects on the ground, we've prepared a short video for you presenting four different Irish organisations that have really made the most of European projects over the last couple of years. And as well as showing what can be achieved with European funding, this video really sh shows actually the range of organisations that are involved. Surprised, in the OA. And if you have anything to say about it, please leave your comments in the chat or on Twitter. Take a look. The main aim of the project was to develop a system of validation for the non-formal learning and informal learning of childminders in the hopes of creating 
pathways to recognise this learning in order to ensure that it becomes qualified and they get qualification at the end of it. This was something we were really interested in because we really wanted to enhance our knowledge and our expertise in the area of child minding. So that's what motivated us about this particular project. With the current project that we're running, we have had a range of different activity days and that also allowed for many of the adults to speak with the local councillors and government officials and kind of air accessibility issues and give a new light to people in politics who would be able to kind of promote that change. I think the project empowers young people with disability by giving people with disabilities a voice and teaching our clients about advocacy, self-empowerment. My name is Stephen. I attend the Life Skills Programme. I am very passionate about advocacy and human rights. My confidence has really grown. I have become more confident in public speaking since I have been involved with Erasmus. Our key aim is to try and give a voice to people who wouldn't normally have a voice in media. Part of that is to engage with local community and community groups in a community development way and train people to understand that they can take an ownership on how they're represented um, and how their voice comes across in media. The project that we have just finished was called IMAC, Ethical Media for Active Citizenship. And the focus of the project was in some way explore ways that we can integrate diversity and a more inclusive approach to media content production into what we do really in community media. So our project was called Special Education, Looking at the Whole Child. And the aim of the project was to empower all our teaching staff to provide a more holistic education to our pupils in the school. Our project was centred around the education of the whole child special, in special education. However, we turned it around in such a way that our entire school was involved in the project. So it became the whole school project with everybody's education being special and catered for, which leads to the idea of uniqueness and diversity, the inclusion model of special education. As an organisation, we've also learned a huge amount from managing a project of this kind and from engaging with LERGIS, the National Agency, about the skills and expertise that are needed to run a project and to manage a project of this kind. So we've learned at, at multiple levels. It has given us huge benefits. The single best thing about taking part in the Erasmus Plus programme has to have been the interaction between our clients and staff and being involved in the committee and then getting to see our activity days and getting to see them engage. It's just been amazing to see the growth and the confidence in our clients. So what I've learned most from this project is that by collaborating with other professionals across other European schools, we can learn so much from each other. And I think that the Erasmus Plus programme is an ideal opportunity for teachers to go out and, and learn from other schools, from other countries, and bring, bring those best practices home and implement them in their own schools. Being connected with similar organisations across Europe actually is an amazing experience. First, because it brings you out of the situation where you are a local, a small organisation, and you are very, sometimes you feel isolated in the work you do. So really, it re-energizes you in some ways, you know, to see others that are doing the same work that you are doing. We've always enjoyed working with Lergus. We find them a really nice sort of um, group to, to work with and to support us. So it was lovely to be able to have them on the phone when we needed them and ask them in more detail about what we needed. So it just felt like a supportive space and that you, you weren't left on your own to, to do your project and, you know, and see where things fall. So yeah, it's, and it's lovely to work with a group like that. My biggest learning from this whole experience has to be how important collaboration is and how important communication is. And I think during the middle of this um, project, obviously the pandemic hit, 
and it was never more evident how important effective communication was and to stay connected outside of meeting to formulate really good communication systems via Zoom, um, contact via email and keep people up to date. So collaboration I think was the biggest learning for me in this whole experience. I would say to somebody who's considering getting involved in an Erasmus Plus programme to just do it. Go for it. I think it's a really worthwhile experience. They'll never regret it. And they will meet people and develop partnerships and build relationships that could last a lifetime. So there you go. Just do it. The takeaway perhaps we can take from that video highlighting and showcasing just four organisations that have been making the most of European programmes and projects in Ireland for the last um, couple of years. So I hope you enjoyed that. And in just a couple of minutes, actually, I'll be speaking to some of the people we met in that video. So or from organisations like the Central Remedial Clinic, Castle Connell National School, Early Childhood Ireland, Near FM and also the Night Orchard Clock Jordan. And as we saw and what Lorraine as well, Gilligan highlighted a bit earlier, Erasmus Plus is not just the only kind of European funded opportunities that are available via Lergos. There's also the European Solidarity Course. It's a program that, as we heard earlier, has proved very, very resilient and very, pro uh, very uh, popular. I mean, even throughout the challenges that the pandemic um, showed. And it funds and it supports young people to volunteer for causes that they feel are very important. And we hear that volunteers often say afterwards, or they often stay with organisations for several weeks after either in their home countries or abroad. And groups of leaders can also set up their own projects. So to find out more about this, we can take a look now at a little short video made for the European Programmes launch earlier this year. Let's take a look. The European Solidarity Corps project that the Glucksman was involved in was called Art in Action. And it's built upon a, a programme of creative activities that the museum have been running for a number of years with young asylum seekers. And as part of the European Solidarity Corps project, we teamed up with a group of volunteers from University College Cork. When Tig first approached us about it, and said, oh, I want to do an art workshop with kids from Dark Vision. I was like, yes, I love art, creativity, and I really enjoy working with the kids and anything that I can do to make people or help people have a little bit of a nicer time, happier life, I'm happy to do it. Involve Your Project Mead is an organisation that works um, specifically with young people from the travelling community and other young people um, who are disadvantaged, age from about 8 years of age up to 25. Um, our main focus will be on young people who are aged 10 to 18. We do many different programmes um, from homework, after school support to STEAM programmes um, concentrating on science, technology, engineering, art and maths and we also do Erasmus work which we're very proud of. It was originally planned that we would go for day trips and uh, meet up and do other activities with other people all across Europe. But with COVID, we had to do most of it online. It was still amazing. I got to meet loads of amazing people uh, and have some really nice experiences, uh, learn a lot about solidarity and collective consciousness and other things like that. Clock Jordan Community Farm is a community supported agriculture project. The idea is that through a membership model, we can ensure that farmers get paid well on time on a monthly basis, which allows them to grow food without the stress, without the financial stress involved. And as a, as a group, we take the risk. You know, if you have a bad year, if there's a bad frost, we get a, the odd drought and stuff like that, that we all kind of take on that responsibility together. With the ESC, I've come to Ireland. I've moved back here because I'm an Irish national and Australian national as well too. Uh, I've come for this opportunity for farming and within a community called the Clock Jordan Community Farm. Uh, it's an eco village and it's a learning opportunity for young people 18 to 30 like myself and Jorge. On Mondays we do sports activities with the kids uh, and it's probably their favourite thing to do. They love to run around and uh, get all sweaty and crazy. So this is a game called Bomb where we throw the ball and if someone drops the ball you've got 10 seconds to get rid of the ball or you're out. 
uh, and it was raining, so we're underneath the marquee as well. Uh, so yeah, handling COVID and then being outside and doing all of that, uh, that was eventful and fun. This is in one of the rooms, like down in the basement of the Glucksman, and oh my God, it's a room that can just be like, art goes everywhere. You know, the, there's, we push back the tables, paper on the floor, all the, you know, pencils, paints, and the kids come in off the, we walk over from the bus and they come into the Glucksman and it's just like, okay, we're here, we're ready to do art. The room is just chaos, but the good kind of chaos. It's one of my favorite things about being here at UCC was getting to do these workshops. Uh, this is in our first few weeks and uh, we've got the Kubota tractor here, Jorge's on the back. We've just done a load and we're taking it back to the farm. Uh, it's great we uh, were able to learn how to drive the tractor, whether we've, we know or not, uh, but there's lots of opportunities for us here, which is great. Um, also, my grandfather has the same Kubota, so it's quite nice for me to be driving that. I feel like I'm back in my childhood. Having this international group of young people in our town just adds this vibrancy and energy and gives opportunities for, for local young people to stay in town and gives them a reason you know, to come back and visit often. I think it was really important for our young volunteers to feel connected to other groups around Europe, to understand that actually they're not working in isolation, but rather they are part of a wider movement of young people who are working towards similar goals. I have friends all over Europe now, so it, it's amazing. Like, you think when you get to a certain age that you're not going to keep um, broadening your friendship pool, but you do, and it, it's fabulous. Growing up mixed race in Ireland, I benefited a lot from community outlets uh, and other programs like that. And I really wanted to give back uh, and kind of take what I had learned from, from my own experience and, and being able to give that to young people. That would be the main reason that I uh, originally got involved in volunteering. I think it's important to me because community, the people who surround me, everybody, I like, I like working with people and if I can, you know, help make someone's life a little bit easier or um, open up some opportunities or some doors to other people, then why not use that time for something like that? For me it's important because, I don't know, when, when I help, like, people or animal or nature or whatever, like I feel better with myself. I, I like volunteering basically the same reasons as Jorge, but also it gives uh, people like myself uh, the opportunity to work in fields that we might not have access to in a work setting. So by volunteering, there's always a need that you're giving back to a community or a project, but also you're gaining these skills and experiences for yourself that's gonna propel you for the future as well. I think it's a great opportunity, so anyone who's 18 to 30 they should definitely look into this. I would love to continue volunteering. Uh, I'd really like to volunteer abroad. It's, it's been nice volunteering at home. I have volunteered before abroad as well, but I'd like to keep going. I would do this again in an absolute heartbeat. In fact, I hope and I think we will have more projects uh, with the Glucksman. It's something that's going to propel you for your future. You're always learning and if it's an interest that you like, it's worth honing in on. Welcome back. I hope you enjoyed that video and a big thank you to the University College Cork to Involve Youth and to Clock Jordan Community Farm for participating and sharing their information with us for that video. It was incredibly inspiring and I loved how one girl said, you know, I'm getting older. I never thought I'd still be able to make friends, but now I have friends all over Europe. What an amazing advantage of getting involved in one of those, one of these European programs. And it's something I can adhere to. My friends that I made on Erasmus and on the Leonardo da Vinci program many years back, I still have. I call them my best friends. It means you're somewhere nice to visit around Europe and have a wonderful new cultural experience. But now let's move on. I hope you are settled with a nice cup of coffee or tea because now we have an opportunity to actually bring in some of the people we've met in the video earlier and have a chat about how Irish organisations can make the most of European programmes. So any questions that you have about this, logistic questions, silly questions or anything you like, just pop them in the chat there and we will address them throughout the next couple of minutes. So joining us this morning, I'd like to say hello to Mary Carlin and Noel Carl. They're from the Central Remedial Clinic. Good morning. 
Also joining us today, Fiona Kelleher from Early Childhood Ireland. Good morning. So Elaine King, who we met there in the video from Near FM. Good morning, Elaine. Good morning. And Brian Dillon from Castle Connell National School. Good morning. Morning. And Connor Mungie from The Night Orchard. Good morning. Hey, guys. The Night Orchard. Perfect. Lovely to see you there. Thank you so much uh, for joining us. And let's kick off perhaps with um, Mary. And Mary, can you just tell us a bit more about the work that the Central Median Clinic does? Absolutely. So um, we will, the part of the Erasmus kind of program is the Training and Development Centre. And we operate and provide five programmes that provide a day survey for adults with um, intellectual and physical disabilities. And also no... Yeah, so um, the wider work of the Central Media Clinic, we are um, a clinic that provides um, clinical supports for adults and children with physical and intellectual disabilities. Um, we have two primary schools and seven locations around Ireland, mostly to Dublin. Um, I work myself in adult services along with Mary, and we would cater for around 400 adults um, across five locations in North Dublin. Um, Erasmus has allowed us to expand the program and work in, in areas that we never thought we'd get the opportunity to um, kind of explore uh, with European funding. And it's been, it's been really cool. So the Central Media Clinic do a lot of work um, like in, in, in the area of advocacy. And Noah, when did you find out about the European yeah. programs that you could, um, that. could get access to? So actually, we went um, to one of the open days run by Lurgus, uh, Be The Spark, and that was back in 2018. Um, we talked to some of the staff and some of the other projects, and we were able to then come up with an idea of our own. We had, the UNCRPD hadn't been ratified at that time for people with disabilities in Ireland, so we could use that as a catalyst to kind of work around the um, inclusion piece, um, working with Lergus, and we developed a really, really cool advocacy program called The Rights to Decide. So our young adults got to meet with local decision makers, and they held events, and they invited these people along. And during that whole process, it actually, the, the UNCRPT was ratified. Um, and it felt like a real victory, not just as part of our program, but as part of like the World of Disability Services. So um, that's kind of our first project, and that's how we got involved with Lurgus. But we're on our third project now, and it's just it's just growing wings. I think Mary is kind of working really hard on this program. So you want to? Yeah. Do you want to so, tell us about uh, that program, Mary? Program, I started this. Absolutely, I started at the CRC a year ago. So I have been a part of the wayfinding program, and that has allowed some of our adults to navigate their own community through using technology. So some of the students, they weren't able to use Zoom before. And during the pandemic, we've now implemented this hybrid model. So it's been fantastic to see kind of their skills really be enhanced, um, thanks to Erasmus. And it also has provided a sense of community during the pandemic. Um, Which I, is I think so important. Actually, you've been working with a number of organizations like that. Yeah, and local government, I think has been brilliant too. Yeah, absolutely. We've had a lot of local TDs as well. Um, log on for our make way day so a lot of our adults were allowed to kind of communicate with them and discuss their own lived experiences of inaccessibility in ireland for people with disabilities so that was fantastic to see that space mm. and mary so this is your third program that you're on so i guess the future will be getting involved in lots more european programs and seeing what else is out there that you can access No, absolutely. So this is actually my first one, but I would love to continue to be a part. I've seen how yeah. it's allowed our kind of students to really enhance their confidence and their advocacy skills. So we'd love to continue it. So, yeah, I, I've been involved in all three um, programs that we've run so far, and they have been incredibly successful. They've actually just built on each other. So we're hoping then once once the Wayfinder project is over, we will develop something that kind of will, will resemble... Um, maybe like an accessible Google Maps for people who where they develop within their own communities. They will they will actually map it out themselves. And that, that's kind of like working with then their local councils. They'll be able to identify where 
kind of pathways and accessibility issues will 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 benefit uh, every council and community. So yeah, we're we're really excited about our partnership um, with Erasmus and Lurgus funding um, and kind of how we can develop that even further. Maybe enter into like a, a solidarity course project. We do have a solidarity course project, but it's run with our primary schools um, and uh, our secondary schools. It's not running our adult services. Um, so we're not directly involved with that piece, but um, we do have a Key Action 3 program running at the moment. And we're hoping then maybe to look at maybe a Key Action 2 or a Key Action 1 uh, where we would have a European partner. Um, and that would give us a whole new dimension um, to to kind of what we do here in the CRC um, and see what other people in disability services are doing across the world um, and kind of partner with them, see what best practice mm -hmm. would be then within that community. So that's what we're hoping to, to achieve yeah. down in the future. It, it, it's really exciting and um yes yeah, absolutely yeah so it, it's really exciting and, and it's something that we're really hoping that that can only be developed obviously uh COVID has put a kind of stop on the whole uh travel piece um but it's been amazing actually um as part of Lurgus uh in 2019 I got to attend the Access City Awards with one of the participants on our program um, and we got to go to the European Disability Forum and it was absolutely brilliant because it really showed like the power of people with disabilities on a on a more European level than just um, a national level here uh, in Ireland. And it was something that I would love to see happen again very, very soon. Uh, and given the adult the empowerment, the adult that came with me now is highly involved in advocacy across uh, all of our services and is, is, a, is a real advocate for people with disabilities. Okay. Nola Mary, thank you so much for speaking to us this morning. And of course, not easy to speak to us at a virtual forum with masks and you did so well. Thank you so much. We'll be coming back to you a little bit later, perhaps. <laughs> but now we can move on and bring in Fiona, Fiona Gallagher from Early Childhood Ireland. Good morning, Fiona. Good morning, Maeve. Um, thank you so much for having me. Lovely to see you there. Um, can you just tell us first about the Val Child Project? I can, of course. Yeah, so um, Val Child was um, our European project, it was a K2 um, project and it involved four other partner countries, Greece, France, Portugal and the Netherlands. And I suppose the project focused on the validation of informal and non-formal learning of childminders, which includes the skills, knowledge and competencies, I suppose, acquired by childminders over years in practice. And what Valchild really aimed to do was develop a mechanism for validating or recognizing these experiences, these skills, knowledge and competencies um, of childminders with a plan to create pathways and guidance towards further training and qualifications. Okay, and talk us through a little bit your path of interacting with uh, European programs when it all started. Yeah, so um, I suppose Early Childhood Ireland have been involved with Erasmus Plus programs for a number of years. Um, our organisation supports uh, quality early years experiences for our members across Ireland, um, where we have nearly 4,000 members of preschools and full and part-time daycare services. And I suppose really the most important thing is that we learn and see what else is happening in Europe. So we were involved at the beginning on KA1 projects, which um, I suppose involved a lot of mobility and bringing groups over and back to other European countries. And then from there, we started looking at the KA2 projects where we actually had partnerships with other countries and um Childminding was an area that we really wanted to look into a little bit more. So back, I think it was 2006, we started, or 2016, we started looking at um, uh, developing a program for childminders. And then when that project finished in 2018, we moved then into Valchild. So one pro mm -hmm. program sometimes leads into another program, which is just fantastic and great. Mm -hmm. That is great. And how have you adapted your work with COVID? Has it posed a lot of challenges or have you managed okay? Absolutely. I mean, as, as uh, Mary and Noel alluded to, the fact that COVID was very challenging and it is very challenging times for us. Um, we were very lucky with Valchild in particular um, because we had, this project started in 2018. So we had met as a group um, a number of uh, twice anyway before um, the COVID hit and, and stopped our travels. So we were able to, I suppose, formulate as a group, which I think was really important, and build relationships. Um, 
And then we were able to transform those relationships into Zoom and, and keep up those contacts um, via emails and Teams and all those other platforms that we try to use to keep communication lines open. But it was very challenging because I think um, part of the project is about mobility. It is all about um, sharing practice and seeing other countries in action and learning from that as well. So it was very challenging when that was kind of taken away towards the end of this project. But we got great support um, from Lergus and we were guided hugely on how to adapt and how to change. And I mean, I think that they responded so well um, in a time of crisis. And I felt that support hugely as the project, as the EU project officer for Early Childhood Ireland. So I, I really appreciated that. There you go. So kudos to all those behind the scenes from Lergas to Fanula, Charis and Anya putting the event um, on as well today. Thank you so much for their support. Well, let's um, bring in now Connor Mungi. He's from the Night Orchard. Connor, how are you there? Where are you joining us from today? I'm joining you from Clot Jordan or just outside of Clot Jordan, a small little town called Ballingarry at the moment. Lovely. I'd love to be there. <laughs> Sounds divine. Can you tell us first a little bit more about the Night Orchard? Yeah, so uh, the Night Orchard is is kind of a, a new project uh, that myself and a few colleagues have taken on. Um, we've been working with young people for a number of years in different uh, in different roles and capacities, and we kind of um, we found there were so many young people kind of looking to find direct responses to kind of climate change and looking for for real connections in the kind of environmental movement, and so. We thought that we were in a very good position to uh, provide them with um, such connections, and our, our real our real drive is to um, to arm young people with kind of the practical skills that a lot of people are are missing, and um, including economic skills about how you can how you can actually make a livelihood by you know um, very useful yeah <laughs> very useful. So tell us how it all panned out. Well, we've just started our first ESE project with volunteers and, you know, it's early days. We're only two months into our first project and uh, so far, so good. Um, yeah, we have a team of um, we have a team of five volunteers and um, what we're really trying to focus on is is diversity. And so in these first two months, we've really just started um, with a very wide range of activities. And as we continue would like to kind of find the real skills and interests of individual volunteers and try to, you know, put those put those skills into action. Very useful, very useful. And climate change and the environment, do you think that it's an overall priority in Ireland in general? Do you get that feeling? In Ireland in general, um, I would say on a governmental level, I, I don't believe that it is really a priority. You know, I think that there's, um, there's lots of, there's lots of words being spoken at COP26 and all of this stuff, but um, I don't know. I don't. I don't have a huge amount of faith that we're really that we're really tackling this crisis as a as a nation. And and what about the young people that you work with? What would they? What would their message be? I think that the young people that I work with, and I mean, and this is it from working with young people for for a while. There's a real, you know, there's a real drive in them to. To, to be involved and to get involved in responses to climate change. And I think a lot of young people are kind of out there on their own and don't, don't know how to meaningfully connect uh, with the bigger challenges. And um, now we don't kind of see ourselves as being a, an advocacy group as such on a governmental level or something like that. We're much more involved in giving young people the, the skills to kind of tackle problems on a much smaller kind of community basis. And also life skills, it seems as well. Well, look, Connor, thank yeah. you so much for sharing all that with us about the Night Orchard. If you have any questions for Connor or any other of our panelists, do please leave them there in the chat or you can take to Twitter as well using the hashtag Lergus Forum. But now let's bring in Elaine King from Near FM. Good morning, Elaine. Good morning. How are you doing? Thanks for having me. Great. Yeah, lovely to see you there. We met you there in the video. Can you tell us, I mean, a little bit more in depth about the work that Near FM does. Uh, sure, yeah. So um, Near FM, we're based in Coolock in North Dublin. Uh, we started out as a pilot radio station about over 25 years ago. Um, and it, it started out of the need to um, 
kind of tackled the, the way that North Dubliners are often seen in media um, in terms of, yeah, I suppose they're often often represented in a, in a negative light um, and accents in North Dublin are seen a certain way. So that's how it initially started uh, with a group of people. Since it then, it's developed in, in loads of different ways. Um, media literacy is sort of at the core of what we try and do. So trying to educate people around diversity and inclusion, um, the importance around um, giving people a voice and um, it kind of works, it, it opens up in a whole load of different ways these days into, around uh, podcasting. Uh, we have a television mm -hmm. arm as well. Um, yes, yeah, so it's quite fair. It's funny what you say there. It's funny, Elaine, mm. what you say, say there about the accents. I remember a good friend of mine, I'm from Navin in County Meath, and a friend of mine also from Navin, County Meath, aspired to be on the radio, on the airwaves one day, and she tried to get into 104 FM, 98 FM, but they said, no, your accent is too culty. So she had to drive around and work in promotions instead and hand out freebies. She didn't get her voice on air because her voice was from Navin, County Meath. So, like, a lot of discrimination on the airwaves. Uh, so I'm glad that you're doing something about it there at Near FM. Um, and I know you have experience with the Ethical Media for Active Citizen Project. That's the name of the project that you've been working on. Can you tell us yeah. how it started and then where it led to? Sure, yes. Yeah. So um, we, as part of our training, so it's in it's open access, the media co-op. So all of the, the programs that are produced are produced by volunteers. Um, as, and we then train people up. So the idea is it's open access. Anyone in the community can come in. And um, they we give them a training course beforehand. So obviously they know how to produce a program and, and go on air. Um, and as part of that, we've always had ethics in it, in the training that we do. Um, and media literacy, but we wanted to develop that a bit more because there's been there's so much. I mean, you know how things have changed over the years around it with hate speech and you know every everything, the internet and how um, and how people have started to really see these ideas around inclusion and the influence media can have. So yeah, so we really we, we've been working on European projects for quite a long time, the media co-op, and um, this particular one was was a way for us to develop that that kind of training and put time into it. And um, for us, European projects sort of um, allow us to focus, you know, so often you, you want to be able to do this work, but there's so much else that's dragging you away. Um, and so this gives us a, gave us a real chance to to see what other countries were doing and how they were tackling these issues. Um, it's a particularly interesting one around Europe and how different countries deal with things like hate speech and and how our media landscape is different to other media landscapes. Um, and the project itself then is a it's a, it's a training, so it's a train the trainer in a sense. And um, so teachers can go online and they can download um, modules. They're quite simple and, and easy to use and you kind of follow a, a module um, to give you uh, techniques and tips to do things like, talk about things like privilege and um, diversity, how to read the news, um, quite a variety of things in there um, that it can be quite challenging to teach. I know we can often find it quite challenging. So they kind of give you something solid to work through um, and in doing it, you know, we've been piloting things like um, teaching the, the privilege work um, and now we've moved it online since since COVID and everything. So it's been, a, okay. been an interesting right. time. <laughs> yeah. Sounds fascinating. Sounds really good. And tell me, you mentioned the word podcasting and podcasts. Mm -hmm. So how have you been exploring podcasts? What have you been um, up to in that area? Yeah, I mean, it's the same thing. So we work with volunteers and we train people up through podcasting and um, everything is about trying to build more inclusive media. And so training people who maybe wouldn't normally have access to to media and to those sort of skills and to try and give them um, the ability just to bring their story through in a different way um, and to support them. But also to think about language and how people use language in those ways and the importance of the impact that different ways of telling stories can have in society in general. Um, yeah, so it's, I suppose it's an area that the Media Co-op is sort of developing on um, and it's been useful with different European projects. We've been able to uh, create those sort of podcasts in a different way. And we've we've um, mm. we worked on a project, Respect Words, which was all around hate speech. And we created um, podcasts in, 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 about that as well. So Amazing. And podcasts are all about accents and voices and upsot and ambiance. So really nice. So we have a question for you, Elaine. Um, I don't know who it's from, but it's for you. And it says, ethical media active citizen sounds like a very valuable project. Do you feel like fake news and online misinformation is impacting people? And what can we do with regards to this in our day-to-day -day lives? Question there for you, Elaine. Okay, that's big. That's a big question. <laughs> yeah, I mean, challenging, yeah, I do, huh? do you think 
Yeah, yeah. I think it is an area that obviously, given the work that we do, we, we think media is, is so important. And I think particularly these days with young people as well, that it can it can influence everything around emotions and and um, and how people are feeling. And it, it, it's hard to get away from media um, more and more. And so education, I suppose, for us is the key. And um, giving people the opportunity to come together and to be able to discuss things. So often we're in our little bubble and, and we're not able to, you know, it's hard, it's hard. It's not easy to differentiate different things. Um, we work across the spectrum. So, you know, working with adults, um, adults and young people. So we take different approaches with that. The, this particular, um, project, uh, through the different modules, we kind of work through, um, how to read media. So if you read certain headlines, who's, who's, who's writing, looking at who's writing the article, how is it written? Why is it written a certain way? Um, so all that kind of media literacy that can break down um, and get people just to stop and think about what they're reading and how they're reading it. Um, yeah, so certainly I think it does definitely have an impact on people's lives um, and how people are viewed in society and who, who gets given the voice and who gets given the opportunity to have their say in society is, is really, really important. Um, so I think it's it's incumbent because it's active citizenship. I think that, um, part of what we try and do is it's incumbent on all of us to take the responsibility of what we're putting out as well. You know, we're all journalists really these days, you know, everyone is putting things out into media. So it's important for all of us to step back and understand what language we're using and what impact that can have on other people. Absolutely. Thanks, Elaine. And thank you so much to the person who put that question to Elaine. Great answer. And just one other question for you, Elaine, before I let you go. Would you have any advice or any tips for another organization considering getting involved with a similar European program? Um, yeah, I think for us, what we've kind of over the years, um, what we try and do is, is try and find something that's um, projects that are really work that we want to be doing. So something that adds on to something that we're already doing, that it's not fully new for us, is really valuable. Um, and then also something that's aspirational. So we want to also learn, you know, the way. So trying to get that balance, I think, is really is really something that works and makes a project really, really useful. Um, I would also say to start, if you can, as a partner rather than maybe necessarily leading a project. Um, and that way you can get to know your different partners and, you know, get to know what you can learn from them and, and how they respond to the different work and, you know, where you can balance up that kind of work. So I think that's a nice place to start, just to start as a partner first. Um, rather than a lead. Start as a partner rather than a lead. Elaine King there from Near FM. Thank you so much. Really interesting. And now we can bring in Brian Dillon from Castle uh, Connell School. Brian, good morning. How are you? Great. And yourself? Great. Are you in your kitchen? I'm actually inside in um, the special education room in a school. So I've I just left my 30 children about 20 minutes ago and that's a special education okay. teacher to uh, continue my work while I find a bit of quiet space. <laughs> oh, thank you. We're delighted to have you. It's great to have you with us. Can you first tell us a bit about Castle, um, Connell School and about your involvement in the Erasmus Plus programme? Okay. Well, Castle Connell National School is a, a small town or village it's about 10 miles from Limerick. It's on the River Shannon in Limerick, in County Limerick. Um, my first involvement was... I remember a number of years ago, I'd always had in my mind I'd like to do an Erasmus project, but I was kind of put off by what I heard was uh, too much paperwork was involved in the application. So it was only when I went, went to an open day up in Dublin and I met a few people on Lairgas and I realised that it was very doable. Apologies for the noise, that's just the sound of the bell in our school. Um, <laughs> so, um, I just, <laughs> so I just put a project together. We, we have a 20, 20 uh, member staff in our school made up of 10 class teachers, five resource teachers, teaching assistants. We've a diverse population of 250. So my interest was always special education. So I want to put a special education project together. And I thought from our school that, you know, maybe in our own school, we were looking too much at formal literacy and numeracy initiatives. And maybe we needed to think outside the box and do a bit more. So I called our project special education, looking at the whole child. So the project was a, a teacher education project where our our teachers went around and went to four different um, um, locations in Europe and um, went to two courses, one course on, on the counselling for autistic children and another course on art therapy. And then we also went to two, visited two schools in Europe, in Barcelona and Stockholm. 
So we, we, we went and learned in a formal setting, in a European setting, and then we went and observed in the school good practices across a European context. And we tried to bring all that learning back to the school. So we had three teachers going in each trip, and then they brought back the knowledge and the learning they got. And we decided then to just try, again, the overall aim of the project was so that our pupils would be empowered to de- de- deliver a more holistic education to our pupils. So even though the project started and we were looking at special education, how we'd improve special education. But I'd say by the time the project was finished, you know, we looked at it from the point of view as well, all our children are special and let's give them the best education they can. Um, so I would say actually the, the project was a fantastic success. Um, the only thing it, issue is that when you have teachers going off on trips and coming back again, how, how real do you make that to the pupils? So we were conscious of that. Like what does, what does a four-year-old child or a five-year-old child know about Lergus or inclusion or diversity those words how do you make it real to children of a, of a lower age so we organized two um, headline events in our school for the duration of the project one was an art exhibition where every pupil in the school school got to paint a picture and put it up on the wall so we had um, an art exhibition with hundreds of pictures on the wall we brought all the parents of the school in and had an, an open day we got sean kelly mep to open the day and we just had a fantastic day and the children is something the children will always remember. And that all came from members of our staff going to visit, going to a course in Europe on art therapy and just finding out new ways to teach art. And then another headline event was we had, we had was again, just to, so the children would understand like, you know, the word Erasmus, what does it mean? So we organized a soccer competition for one week in June where all the children in the school went into, onto a soccer team, a European team, whether it was France or Germany or Italy, and we all learned about that country during the week, and we all played a soccer tournament. And at the very end of it all, we had you know a winners of the cup, the Erasmus. We played for the Erasmus Cup, and even still to this day, years later, when the children talk about Erasmus in the cup, that's what they say to me. They say, "Oh, the Erasmus Cup." Amazing. So I guess it brought Europe to them. Exactly, exactly. So again, is the whole day I the project is you know we're a small village like on the periphery of Europe, and how would you make you know Europe real to them? It's only by, by having real events inside in this classroom or inside in the school. And from the teachers being in Barcelona and Stockholm. Incredible. And I was saying earlier that inclusion is one of the priorities of the, the Erasmus Plus programme. How does that impact your, your day-to-day work and your involvement with the projects? Okay. Well, I would say, I mean, a very, one of the courses we went to was a course in Europe. Europe was, um, it was in Italy about um, autistic children and counselling. And we went to visit a school in Italy when we were over there. And before we went over there, we would have had one idea of what inclusion was in our own school. You know, you think of children with needs and how we make them part of the school. But it's only when we went over and visited a school in Europe that you see things from a deeper perspective. So what I see from the project is we're all learning from each other. We're all, but by going to these courses, not only are we learning from the courses, but from chatting to teachers and observing practice in the schools, we're, we're learning so much from each other. And what we learned from the course in going to Italy is that, you know, that their form of inclusion we found was, was way deeper than ours. So not only were they looking at mm. a child and how can they read and can they write and can they do their sums, but, you know, they had a whole, you know, a physical education program designed for the child with special needs or for the child with physical needs. So they looked at the whole aspect of the child, every part of their development okay. and their, and, and did programs which, which, Helps them develop as people and as pupils. Great. And it's only a matter of time, I suppose, Brian, till people start coming from all over Europe to Castle Connell there in Limerick to take tips as well from you guys. Well, that's on the agenda for our next project, which I'm, I'm, I'm working on at the moment. Brilliant. Look forward to hearing about that. But let's we've bring in now a question. Thank you very much for that. So we have a question for Fiona from Early Childhood Learning. And it says, sounds like a great project. Do you... Um, I can't read that, but sorry. Do you formal certificate qualifications? Oh, sorry, I can read now. Do you offer formal certification or qualifications to to Val Child participations? So, question for Fiona: Do you offer formal certification or qualifications to Val Child participate to participants? There you go, Fiona. <laughs> Thanks, Maeve. Um, great sorry, question. Sorry, I didn't read it very well. It was it was blocked no. a, bit of, a bit of my screen there, but I got I got it out. <laughs> That's no problem. Um, yeah, it's a great, it is a great question. And I suppose, um, Val Child Project just ended there in July. And, um, I suppose the goal for Early Childhood Ireland by being part of this was to work towards that. So currently 
No is the simple answer. Um, because the system isn't in Ireland to support it yet, but changes are happening and we're hoping that these mechanisms will be in place to support childminders to actually be able to have some of the skills and competencies that they've required over years of working in the sector um, accredited at some level or work towards a qualification um, in that idea of recognising prior learning um, and developing a system of RPL for, for Ireland as a whole, but in is, is specifically looking at childminders. Um, so in other countries and in other partners, we had to develop this program that it would be European friendly, that it's, it's applicable to all. So in some countries, those mechanisms are there and this project just slots nicely in, whereas in Ireland, currently the system isn't there, but it's up and ready to go. So when it does happen, we're ready to, to meet the need. You're ready. Brilliant. Thanks, Mill and Fiona, for that. Uh, we have a message from Aidan, Stacey, in our audience for Mary and Noel. So Mary and Noel, listen up. Um, Aidan says, I'd love to drop in from next door in Irish Wheelchair Association to chat through your experiences with you. So there you go. Message from Aidan, Stacey. <laughs> yeah, Thank you so much, Aidan, Stacey. Yeah, come on over. Yeah, <laughs> come on over. Yeah, come on over. Uh, I, I'm happy to think of what you after this, Aidan. Absolutely. Brilliant. I'd say we'd all love to go for a coffee together, but we can do it virtually. It's all about being <laughs> virtual for the moment and safe. And just one question for all of our panelists before I let you go into your break-off sessions. How have you all kept communication going with your project partners over the past year and a half? We can start with Connor. So how yeah, have you well, kept comms open with your project partners over the past year and a half? Yeah, well, we're so used to kind of working remotely with with uh, partners abroad, you know, that it hasn't been that much of a change. Uh, you know, I think it's been with COVID, it's been much harder with the participants in, in lockdowns and stuff like that and keeping those chains of communications open. Um, we have had a few uh, kind of cancellations of some international uh, KA2 projects we wanted to do or, or constant delays, which did make it much harder. But um, in general, with our project partners, we're, you know, we're, we're, we're used to talking to them via Zoom or Skype. It hasn't been a huge problem. Still very much LinkedIn. Brilliant stuff. What about um you what about you, Mary and Noel? Yeah, so we, we don't have any partner because we're doing a key action three, but we do have stakeholders that we, we keep in contact with um maybe across the country and, and across our network. So we have a lot of disability networks that would link in with our um programs. So we've actually developed a website around um kind of our interactions with Lergus and all of our projects that we do there um, and we use Zoom and Microsoft Teams as a way of staying in contact with everybody that's kind of remotely. It's, it's been it's really, really beneficial, especially for people with communication disabilities um, where they have like uh, closed captions on Zoom or Teams. I can kind of see exactly who we are and it's, it's one person in one screen mostly except for today. Mm -hmm. um, but yeah, so it, well, it that's, is... Uh, well, that's it, one positive from the pandemic. We've all up to our, our technological and digital skills, which will be very helpful for our futures. Um, thanks so much. What about Elaine? Uh, yeah, I think for us, as yeah, with the European project, we're sort of used to doing Zooms and everything already, but um, I think what we have done is had meetings more often and made them shorter in the past. Maybe we would have had kind of long meetings. And um, I think over these, over these, kind of a couple of year and a half or whatever how long it's been the um people are fatigued and i think we've learned how to differently change how we work together you know that's been kind of good and it means that we sort of keep people on point with what what everyone has to do a bit quicker so it's um yeah that's been interesting but also using different tools like things like padlets and, and things like that to get all the all the resources together in a, in a quick and easy way um have been really useful brilliant and brian yeah, I've, um, well, we were just ready to start our, our, our second project when all the COVID kicked in. So everything has been put on, on cold storage. So I suppose I've gone to back to basics. Like in a, every, every few months, I, we write each other and email each other and we let each other, each other know what's going on in our schools. Because of the restrictions and the way we have to say in, in pods and schools, that we just found that um, a lot of the stuff was just best, you know, wait, wait until things improve. Very little simple things like, you know, making videos and having children come together and mixing pods and stuff like that it's just it's very awkward doing it so uh, we've actually just kind of kept in touch with each other like and we're keeping an eye on the situation with covid and seeing you know think when will things improve so we can arrange our next um you know our, our business and our trips 
Yeah, as soon as we all get our booster. Thanks for that. So I have a question, Elaine, for you. What frequency can we find near FM on? Quick question it's a 90.2 FM. Thank you very much. Thank there you, you go. And, and we're on question... line as well. <laughs> Say that again. Sorry, we're online as well. So it's just near fm.ie. Yeah. Or near .ie. Near fm.ie. Great. You can have some new listeners. And a question for Connor Mungi. If you had to pick one benefit ESE participants gain from the experience, what would it be? One benefit. Ooh. Well, that's a tough one. One benefit. Um, <laughs> yeah, to narrow it down I, to I one, think, right? Huh. Yeah. I think what it is is, I think it's time, you know, I, I think that, you know, regardless of the day to day project activities, just having this kind of year out where you don't have to worry about, you know, your rent and your finances and you, you get a real chance to kind of to do some do some work on yourself and uh, to take the time with other young people to kind of really think about what 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 you want your future to look like. Thank you so much. And Brian, a question for you. When did the teachers go abroad to Stockholm and Barcelona and for how long? And how did you source the appropriate schools to visit? And how did this program impact on SFN specifically? Um, well, the schools, um, we, we went on to the e-twinning portal where we we just went, joined discussion groups. And um, from that, um, you know, there's messages put up, there's people looking for partners, it's like a dating app, where there's people looking for partners, <laughs> and then we're looking for partners. And eventually you just find a match, like where you're, what you're looking for in your project matches what other school is doing in their project. And that's how we sourced our schools. Um, I suppose it, yeah, Brilliant. that's it. <laughs> that's it. <laughs> Excellent. Um, any more questions there coming in? I don't think so. And it's just 11 minutes past 11, so, or 10, excuse me. I'm in Brussels, so I'm an hour later. Um, so, sorry, I'm confusing everyone now. What time is it? It's, yes, it's 12 minutes past 12 here, and it's 12 minutes past 11 where you are. And that brings our panel discussion to an end. So I would like to thank Mary and Noel from the Central Remedian Clinic. Thank you so much for being with us. Thanks to Fiona Kelleher as well from Early Childhood Ireland. Thank you so much to Elaine King from Near FM and to Brian Dillon there from Castle Connell National School in Limerick. Thank you so much. And to Connor Mungi joining us there. Thank you so much as well from the night order. It was lovely to chat to you. And thanks to all of you who participated and put out your questions out there. That was brilliant. And now um, we can kick off with the next part, which is a breakout session. One is, as you heard from Lorraine earlier, all about well-being and all about our mental health and how to look after it in these very challenging times as we're very much in the fourth wave of COVID here in Europe and with 20, 2021 being another challenging, tricky year. So we thought it was important to put this session out, out there for you. And this session will be moderated by Ashling Brennan. She's from True Self, True Art. And the other session that you can take a look at today, it's all about the recent findings from Lergos, research on the long-term impact of European work placements on the careers and educations, education of VET learners. So if you've ever wondered what a difference a European work placement or experience could have on a participant, not immediately, but several years down the line, this session is for you. And this one is moderated by Charis Hughes. She's an impact, impact researcher at Lyricus. So now after this, you'll be directed to your session that you selected when you registered. But before, I would just like to say thank you so much, Gurmila Mahagut. It's been absolutely lovely joining you virtually from Brussels this morning. There's been great interest, great engagement and great sharing of stories, which is, of course, what this is all about. And thanks, of course, to the Lergos staff and the comms team who've been working really hard behind the scenes to make this happen and make this a reality. And thanks, of course, to Drew, who's technically behind the scenes as well. You can't see him, but he's been doing a great job as well to get us on air and get this show on the road today. So best of luck for the next couple of weeks and months. I look forward to the new horizons ahead. Stay safe. Slán for now.